Good evening, everyone. My name is Andrew Fracknoy. I'm the astronomy instructor here at Foothill College in Los Altos Hills, California. And it's a pleasure for me to wel welcome everyone here at the Smithwick Theater and everyone listening to us on the web to this lecture in the 12th annual Silicon Valley Astronomy Lecture Series. This series of programs is sponsored by the NASA Ames Research Center, the Foothill College Astronomy Program, the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, and the SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence Institute. Tonight's program takes place in our universe, but considers many others. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Anthony Aguirre of the University of California at Santa Cruz. Uh, he is a member of the faculty at Santa Cruz, but before he came to Santa Cruz, he received his PhD from Harvard, then spent three years as a member of the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, where Einstein used to be, before he joined the physics department at UCSC. He's worked on a variety of topics in both physics and astronomy, in particular in theoretical cosmology, the branch of astronomy that deals with the origin, properties, and ultimate fate of the entire universe. Nothing small for this man. One of his research interests concerns eternal inflation, the idea that the universe evolved forever, endlessly spawning bubbles and pockets with potentially diverse properties. He's also studied the nature of dark matter, black holes, the first stars, and the dust between galaxies. He serves as Associate Scientific Director of the Independent Nonprofit Foundational Questions Institute. Ladies and gentlemen, we've been looking forward to this talk for a long time. Here to explain to you the idea of multiple universes, it's a great privilege for me to introduce Dr. Anthony Aguirre. Good evening. It's an honor to be here, and I'm very grateful to the organizers of the Silicon Valley Astronomy Lecture Series for the invitation to come up here and talk to you about the really fun and interesting things that, that I've been privileged to take part of in, in understanding this quest to understand our universe and, and maybe a few others. So I will say some controversial things, I think, tonight. So it's nice to start out on something that I think we can all agree on, and that is that the universe is big. It's true. It's, it's really kind of difficult to fathom how big it actually is. Even when we look out at the night sky, even the, the closest stars are just almost impossibly far away. I mean, if we, if we take the whole Earth, everything we know, everyone we love, and shrink it down to the tiniest, tiny mote of dust, maybe a, a hundredth of a millimeter across, well, then the sun would be a grain of sand, a millimeter in size, and the Earth would be about 10 centimeters away. So there's the sun, there's the Earth. And then the nearest star, that's way down 280, way down, downtown in San Jose, 15 miles away. That's the nearest star. But that's still pretty much small potatoes. If we look at the, uh, the, the Orion Nebula in the center of Orion's belt, that's, that's about 1,000 times as far away as the sun. Um, that would be in the other side of the world in our analogy. It's about 100 million times as far away as our sun is from us. And it lies in a spiral arm of this galaxy with 100 billion or so stars similar to ours. That's 100 tons of sand arranged all 10 kilometers apart from each other. And that galaxy is just one of many that are distributed throughout the galaxy, throughout the universe that, that we can observe. Our modern telescopes have seen millions of them arranged in these large-scale filaments and, and voids. And those are just part of the hundreds of billions of galaxies that make up the observable universe. Now, as we look farther away with our telescopes, we also look farther back in time. And if we look far enough back in time, we come to a time when the universe was so dense that it was opaque to light. Light could not travel through it. And at some point, the universe became transparent to light. And the light that comes to us from that surface 
that comes from the boundary of the universe that we can see. That's the farthest away light that we can see. That light comes to us in the microwave uh, radiation band, and that microwave background comes from this surface that constitutes the boundary of, of the observable universe. So that's it. <laughs> that's the observable universe. And it really is very, very big. I mean, there's no doubt about that. But when you see it like this, you have to ask yourself, is that really all there is? Is that everything? Is that all of creation, that little ball? Or is it just possible that maybe there's something a lot bigger that that is a part of? And that question of how we understood that ball and, and how we got to that point and the question of whether and why we think uh, there may be something a lot bigger that that's a part of, that's the, that's the story I'd like to tell you tonight. And that story starts, as a lot of good physics stories do, with Albert Einstein. So Einstein essentially created cosmology when he devised his theory of general relativity. So this is a brilliant theory in which he said that gravity is not a force like we think of. It's not something that pulls things together. It's actually an effect of the structure of space-time itself. Things move through space-time in what they think is a way that doesn't have forces, but actually the structure of space-time is determined by matter in such a way that as they move through it, they're attracted to each other. Now this was really neat and explained a lot of things and was beautiful, but it did something great for cosmology because unlike Newton's theory before it, Einstein's theory could be applied to the universe as a whole. It could apply, and Einstein, not being an unambitious man, did so very, very quickly. Now, general relativity, if, if you've studied it uh, or if you've heard about it, it's a complicated theory. It's not easy to solve Einstein's equations. So he made a very uh, simple, simplifying assumption, which is that although the universe looks inhomogeneous to our eye, you know, locally, or even if we look out astronomically, at that time they could see that we were in a galaxy, and they could see that there were other galaxies out there. This had just been sort of worked out. It didn't look particularly uniform, but Einstein figured, well, maybe if we look on big enough scales, the universe does kind of smooth out. If we look over these little imperfections of the galaxies and the space between them. Maybe it's more or less uniform on large scales. So we assume that as a simplifying assumption. That turned out to be a great assumption. So if you look now at a, at a much bigger survey of galaxies, every little white spot on that is a galaxy, you see that there are big patches of, of light, a little bit darker and a little bit lighter. But overall, once you get to the scale of that whole picture, you get sort of a uniform gray color. The universe really does start to converge into a uniform distribution. There isn't some huge spot in the middle of this, say. Even better, I showed you that microwave background radiation that was coming to us from the outer extent of the observable universe. Those little red and blue patches correspond to temperature changes in that microwave radiation. Those, in turn, as it turns out, correspond to differences in the density of the universe at that early time. Now, they look significant on that picture, but in fact, those variations are only one part in 100,000. So if we plotted them sort of as variations on a, on a sphere, the universe at that time would have looked like this. So at early times, that time that we look back to in the microwave background, the universe was incredibly uniform, and Einstein's assumption that it was uniform was very, very good. So he assumed that. He also assumed something else which seemed pretty obvious, which is that the universe is more or less always going to be and always has been essentially the same as it is now. The universe just kind of sat there and uh, did its thing. But he discovered quickly that this was hard because gravity generally is attractive, right? If you set something up and it is pulling on itself, it's going to tend to want to contract. And so he realized that his, his universe, this idea of the universe just sitting there forever, was not going to work. Gravity was attractive. But, you know, Einstein is known for being a very clever fellow. So he came up with an idea. He called it a cosmological term. He discovered that there was a term he could introduce into his equations that would correspond to an anti-gravity force. And if you just introduced exactly the right value of this cosmological term, it would produce anti-gravity that would exactly balance the gravity, and the universe could just sit there for all times. This is known as Einstein's static universe. Unfortunately for Einstein at the time, this was also the time when Edwin Hubble was out using a telescope much bigger than this one to observe fairly nearby galaxies. 
And he was making estimates of the distance of the galaxy. This is not an easy thing to do. Um, but he was developing methods to estimate the distance of the galaxies and also measuring the speed with which the galaxies were coming toward or away from ours. Now, this is an easy thing to do in astronomy because when we see light from galaxies, we can identify spectral lines from exactly the same sort of elements that we have here on Earth. So you could look at, say, hydrogen. This gives us this characteristic set of uh, absorption or emission lines at precisely known frequencies. Now, if some blob of hydrogen, say, in another galaxy is moving towards or away from us, then the frequencies of those lines are shifted towards larger or smaller frequencies, just like an ambulance passing by is shifted to higher frequencies, higher pitch as it's coming towards us, and lower frequencies as it goes away. The lines from these galaxies are similarly red-shifted toward larger wavelengths or blue-shifted towards shorter wavelengths. And we can precisely translate those shifts into a speed with which the galaxy is moving towards or away from us. So we made this plot in which he plotted the, on one axis, the distance of the galaxy away from us by his estimate, and on the other axis, the speed of the galaxy. And he found two really interesting things. One was that, with a few exceptions, all of the galaxies were moving away from ours. He also discovered that the farther away the galaxy was, the faster it was moving away from us. So there's really only one conclusion to come from this, which is that the galaxies are all moving away from each other. At least they're all moving away from our galaxy, but it turns out to be much more sensible, as I'll discuss, that they're all moving away from each other. So the galaxies are not just sitting there as in Einstein's static universe. The universe is, in fact, expanding. Now, this gave Einstein his customary new look, um, and he he regretted introducing this cosmological constant. He called it his biggest blunder, because if he hadn't introduced it, he could have predicted that the universe must be expanding, or contracting at least. Um, and by not having faith in his theory, but using this little fix to uh, come into accord with his intuition about just how the universe ought to be, he missed that opportunity. But a new opportunity arose, which was that once you take Einstein's assumption that the universe is uniform on large scales, and that it's expanding, as shown by Hubble, then add those together, you get a beautiful cosmological model. It's the model we call the Big Bang model. And it explains an extraordinary number of things. So first, this, this uh, Big Bang model, where the universe is uniform, explains Hubble's results nicely. So if the universe is sort of like a balloon, where the galaxies are attached to it, then as you expand the balloon, the galaxies move apart. Moreover, in a given amount of time, you can see that two galaxies that are close together move apart by some certain distance. Two galaxies that are farther apart, the distance between them increases more during that same interval of time. Therefore, their relative speed, the speed with which one moves away from the other, is greater in exact proportion to how far away they are. So this beautifully explained the relationship that Hubble found between the distance of a galaxy and how far it's moving away from ours. It also explained that it didn't matter which galaxy you're sitting on, all of the other ones appear to be moving away from you. If you're on this galaxy, or this galaxy, or this galaxy, as the balloon expands, they're all moving away. There's no particular center to the surface of this balloon. Well, here there's a little, there's a little nozzle, but in the, in the real universe there is no such nozzle, and there's no real <laughs> special galaxy from which everything is expanding away. It also made a very clear prediction about remnants from this early phase when the universe was hotter and denser. As the, when the universe was younger, it was uh, higher and higher temperature as you go farther and farther back in time. And at some point, it was at billions of degrees where nuclear reactions happened very efficiently. So the universe cooked the whatever was there into a certain mixture of elements like hydrogen, helium, a few other ones, lithium, deuterium, helium-3, and so on. And it predicted a very precise set of ratios between these elements. Now, we can go out astronomically and look for areas of gas that, that fairly, seem to be fairly unaffected and unevolved from the early universe and measure these ratios. And we find that they're in very beautiful accord with the predictions of this so-called Big Bang nucleosynthesis, the, the nuclei that were left over from this fusion reactor in the early universe. So it had a beautiful success there. Perhaps even more stunning, the 
heat from that early cosmic phase, once it was able to propagate freely, it came to us as this microwave background radiation. And the fact that it was created as heat predicts that there's a very precise relationship between the intensity of the light and the wavelength of the light. It's a so-called black body curve. This is the theoretical curve. This was measured in 1990 by the COBE satellite. And the data points are actually also on there. But you can't see them because the data points are so accurate and the error bars are so small that they're actually covered up by that theoretical line. So this is a beautiful confirmation of the idea that the universe at an early time was dense and hot, as in this hot Big Bang model. Finally, as I said, there were these little variations in that temperature of a part in 100,000 in different directions. It came from the fact that the universe had little variations in its density of a part in 100,000 at that early time. Now, if we take those little fluctuations, where there's a little bit more matter, it will tend to attract more matter to it. Where there's a little less, it will tend to lose more matter from that region. So the size, the amplitude of these perturbations will grow with time in a precise way that we can understand using our knowledge of gravity and, and gas physics and so on. And if we make the prediction of what the fluctuations that we see then should grow into now, they grow into exactly the sort of distribution of galaxies and voids and filaments of galaxies and so on. Statistically, you know, not galaxy by galaxy, but statistically, exactly the same sort of distribution that we see in our galaxy surveys today. So we understand in great detail how these initial conditions for the Big Bang universe evolved into the distribution that we see now. So I think it really is true that the current status of the Big Bang model is that it is a consistent model with no real serious conflicts with the data. And this is an astonishing thing. Now, it does have a couple of small extra ingredients that had to be added in. One of these is dark matter. So it appears that a significant fraction of the universe is made of some stuff that gravitates and yet doesn't interact with light or with particles that we know about uh, much at all. This is weird. But while it's weird to us, it's not really particularly weird to particle physicists. There are lots, of lot, lots and lots of good ideas for what dark matter is. Axions, the lightest supersymmetric particle, et cetera. So, so particle physicists don't, aren't too weirded out by this. It's, it's strange. It's there. Um, but the thing about dark matter that you have to understand is that it, although it's a little bit of a fix, no one would have predicted it before it was observed, I think. Once you postulate just a couple of properties, the, the interaction of the dark matter and how much there is, it explains a whole large set of astronomical data all consistently. So it's a, it's a single hypothesis that explains many, 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 many sets of observations. So that is interesting, and it'll be great to understand what dark matter is if we can, if we can actually figure out exactly what it is, um, but not that troubling. A slightly more troubling thing is that there seems to be a repulsive force, just like the one that Einstein ruefully regretted. And we see this. One of the ways we see this is taking Hubble's diagram and doing a slightly more modern version. Uh, we can go a lot farther out. People did essentially the same exercise with distant supernovae. They looked at the distance of the supernova judged by how bright it is and the velocity that it's moving away from us here. And they did basically the same thing. They saw the beautiful linear relationship that Hubble did. But then as you're looking very far away, you're also, again, looking back in time and the curve the curvature of this, law, of this relation tells you about how the speed of expansion of the universe has been evolving. And so you can get information about how the universe, um, they thought, would be decelerating in, in its expansion because the gravity would be pulling it together. But what they found was something very strange, which is that the universe is, is not decelerating in, in its expansion. The ex expansion is accelerating. It's, go it's expanding faster and faster there has to be some sort of anti-gravity force that is pushing it apart, just like the cosmological term that Einstein introduced. Now, the, the, a more modern way of thinking about this is to think of it um, that this might be attributable to vacuum energy. So vacuum energy is different from normal energy. So if you have a box of normal stuff, say a gas, um, 
the energy in that gas is dominated by the, the gas itself. You know, the E equals MC squared, so there's energy from the fact that there just is stuff in that box. Now, if I let the box expand, two things happen. One is that you notice that the amount of stuff per unit volume has gone down. There's more volume and less, and the same amount of stuff, so there's less stuff per unit volume. The density of the stuff has decreased. This is what the universe would normally do as it's expanding. The density of stuff would decrease. The other thing that, if you think about it, this box is doing is that the box, the stuff in the box is losing energy because it's, it's sort of expending energy by expanding the box. Just like, like if you have a piston in a car, there's a hot gas in there that's pushing on the piston. That's what makes your car go. The hot gas is doing work as it expands. Now suppose we have a box, and although we take all the stuff out of it that we know about, we take all the protons and electrons and so on out, it still has energy. There's just energy in that empty space. Well, now if we expand the box, the density of stuff is just the same because it's, it's still full of nothing, right? The density of nothing, if it has some, stays the same. But the other funny thing that happens is the box gets bigger. Now there's more energy in it because the energy is just given by how much space there is in the box. And so by a bigger box, we have more energy in it. So this is a very strange thing. Rather than losing energy, the box gains energy as it gets bigger. This translates, as it turns out, into an anti-gravity rather than a gravitational force that it will cause in the universe. If the universe is suffused with this vacuum energy, this turns into an anti-gravity rather than a gravitational force. So it, the, the, the current thinking is that the anti-gravity force that we observe in these distant supernovae is due to energy of empty space. Okay, and we'll come back to that. So aside from these kind of strange extra ingredients, this is a beautiful model, but it was realized as early as the late 1970s that there were some kind of strange things about it. Not inconsistencies, but puzzles as to how exactly the universe got into this Big Bang expanding uniform, et cetera, state that it was in. One is that if you just turn the clock back a little bit earlier, say from the say from this nuclear uh, fusion epoch, just a few minutes earlier, the density and temperature, if you extrapolate them back, were infinite. And this is bad. You plug infinity into any equation in physics and you're going to get either crazy results or zero or something. So this is something, someplace where our physics understanding breaks down. Infinite density and temperature. Lemaitre, who developed this uh, Big Bang model first in a way, called this the primordial atom. And he actually thought of it as a big atom. But now we think of it more as sort of the time when physics breaks down, when quantum gravity, if, if we only knew what it was, kicks in and so on. But the point is that we simply don't understand what's going on at that early time. The second question is, why is the universe expanding at all? If you see a ball kind of flying away from the Earth, it's true that you know, that's a perfectly consistent with the laws of physics, but you, you feel like you want to know who threw the ball and why is it going up what, rather than going down or just sitting there. So what put the bang in this Big Bang? A third question is, how did the universe get so uniform? And this is more puzzling than it seems, actually, because if you look at that microwave background that we saw, it's, it's composed of many different, we can think of it as com being composed of many different patches. Say this is one little patch here. Now, one of these patches on this diagram corresponds to how big the universe was, how far light or signals could have traveled since the t equals zero, the primordial atom, and the time from which this light propagates to us. In other words, this is the maximum size over which any physical process, physical processes are limited by the speed of light, the maximum size over which any process could have smoothed out the universe is like that. In fact, it's a little smaller. It's about a degree on the sky out of sort of 180 degrees we can, we can look across. So somehow, although it seems physically impossible, the universe conspired to be perfectly smooth, even though there was no physical process that possibly could have made that happen between the primordial atom and when we look at the microwave background. So this was profoundly troubling to people. And yet, it's not perfectly smooth. There are just the right density fluctuations to give the galaxies and structure and so on that we see. And finally, there's a question of why is the universe so uncurved? That is, Einstein's theory says that space-time can be curved. That's what matter does. 
But if we look at the universe, the geometry of the universe on large scales is that it's not curved. It's basically flat. And one way of characterizing that is to say, what is the scale over which it's curved? So a, a ball, for example, is curved over a scale that's just the, sort of the radius or the size of the ball. The universe is uncurved on scales that are as big as the observable universe. Now, why is this so strange? It's strange because there are just a few fundamental constants in physics. You can create out of the constants h bar that has to do with quantum physics, the constant g that has to do with gravity, and the constant c that has to do with, that's the speed of light, another fundamental aspect of the universe. There's one combination you can make out of these that turns out to be a length. It's 10 to the minus 35 meters. Okay? The size of the observable universe is 10 to the 26 meters. And so the ratio of those, how much bigger the universe is than that length that fundamental physics talks about, is, and this is how my, my five-year-old might describe it when he talks about a really big number, 10,000 million billion 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 trillion trillion times bigger. So where did that really big number come from that says the universe is, is big enough to have all this exciting stuff in it? Why is the universe so big as it is as we saw in, in the initial movie? And then another troubling thing is about this vacuum energy. So you might think that it's really weird to have energy of empty space. But in fact, it's really weird not to. It turns out that our best theory of physics for describing ordinary matter, that's quantum field theory, it, it makes beautiful predictions to 10 decimal place accuracy about the properties of normal stuff, the interactions of atoms, of nuclei, high energy physics particles. That theory of, of uh, quantum field theory, I, I just had a class a couple of days ago where I taught my class the calculation of the vacuum energy. It turns out to be infinite. So you get infinite vacuum energy from quantum field theory. Now, if you, if you massage things and say, well, we don't know how physics works up to you know, infinite energy scales and so on, then you get a number for the, for the vacuum energy, which is just huge, you know, 10 to the 100 or 10 to the 60 times bigger than the one we observe. So there's a huge puzzle that's gone back to the beginnings of quantum field theory as to why the vacuum energy is so small. So they always figured that it would be actually so small that it's zero that there would be some reason why it's zero. But it's not zero either. So it's not huge and it's not zero, it's this tiny little number, why? So these were conundrums that were sitting around and in 1980 or so, Alan Guth put together an idea for a solution to these conundrums. And the idea was that early on, the universe was not just expanding, but it was expanding at an exponential rate. That, was, that is, it was doubling its size again and again and again in a very short period of time. And he posed, postulated that this exponential expansion was driven by vacuum energy. That just as the universe is accelerating now, that, although he didn't know that at the time, that at this very early phase there was this enormous acceleration where the universe was just blowing up, um, not in a sort of stately way, but in this very dramatic way in a short time. From something like um, a billionth of a proton up to the size of a grapefruit. Now a grapefruit sounds small, but compared to a billionth of a proton, it's really, really huge. Um, and that's the minimum amount of, of expansion that inflation had to provide. Now if that process happened, it solves a lot of these problems. So what put the bang in the big bang? Well, it was this anti-gravity force. It is the actual force that gave the kinetic energy, that gave the expansion to all the stuff so that it's now flying apart. It also provides a flatness. It took something small with a relatively small curvature scale and blew it up to an enormous size so that you can't tell it's curved, just like it's very difficult for us to tell that the Earth is curved because we only see this small part of it. It may be that it's just difficult for us to tell that the universe is curved because again, we only see a small part of it and it's gotten blown up so big by inflation. It also explains the uniformity because it can take one of these little patches where physics could have smoothed things out without going anything going faster than light and blows it up so that it can essentially cover the whole sky. And so we're only really looking at one of those little patches. And finally, built into inflation as it turns out is a mechanism that generates just the sort of fluctuations that you need to explain the fluctuations in the microwave background. Now, these are the fluctuations that that COBE satellite measured. It, it saw those in 1992. And when I entered grad school uh, 1995 or so, 
this was kind of the state of the art. There were a few more uh, experiments that had gone on. And the, the, the sort of more technical way of looking at that pretty picture was to say, as a scale on the sky, so where small sizes on the sky go to the right and large patches on the sky are to the left, how big are those variations? So these variations, um, so, so there was the COBE satellite that told you on pretty large patches on the sky, the variations had a certain amplitude. And then there were some other experiments that were telling you about the variations on smaller sizes. The theorists, at the same time, were making predictions based on inflation models that had this very particular shape. They had all these bumps and wiggles, and it had this peak you know, at a particular size on the sky and so on. And when I started grad school, I thought, they're never going to find all these little bumps and wiggles. I mean, that, that would be crazy. And yet, early in this decade, the WMAP satellite took a much, much higher resolution image. It's been going for about seven years now. The same plot looks like this. So this is the data. This is one of those inflationary prediction curves. You see that it actually got all the bumps and wiggles. So it's a spectacular confirmation that we basically know what we're doing in cosmology. And the, the details of this, the, very, the, the, the relative heights of these peaks, the widths of these peaks, and so on, contain information about the universe, how fast it's expanding, the, how much matter there is, and so on. So this, this confirms this inflationary picture beautifully and also gives us lots of information about what the universe is like. So inflation made these not just explain, but made predictions that have come to pass. But it also has a curious side effect, which is that you can wonder if inflation blew up the universe to some enormous size, why would it stop blowing it up at exactly the size of our observable universe, right? What if it just blew it up a little bit bigger? Then there would be our observable universe and some other regions out there that would be like our observable universe that we just couldn't see them, they're too far away. And in fact, that has to be true. It turns out you can show that if inflation is the right theory and predicts, and, and predicts correctly that microwave background map that I showed you, then there have to be at least a million similar regions to ours out there. Inflation had to produce at least a million more regions as big as our observable universe, which would just be some little patch of that. that but that's a minimum. So you can ask, how much could it have produced and that pretty clearly depends on how long inflation went on. The, more, the longer it goes on, the more times it has to double the size of the universe. And so it could have made a spectacularly large number of copies if it just happened for a little bit longer time. So to discover how big the universe really is, we have to think about how inflation happens and how inflation would end, what determines how long inflation goes on. So again, inflation is driven by vacuum energy, but if it was really vacuum energy like a cosmological constant that just was a fixed number, then inflation would never stop anywhere. We would, we would be, infl you know, inflation would be going on here right now. So there has to be some way that, in, that that vacuum energy can change so that after a certain amount of time, inflation stops. So this leads to a picture where there's a field that's just a number for every point in space and time. And that field assigns to every point in space and time a particular vacuum energy. So now vacuum energy can vary from place to place and from time to time. And very conveniently, the physics of a field like that is really, really simple. It turns out that if we plot the vacuum energy as a function of the field, so this is just an arbitrary curve like this, the physics of this at a given point in space looks just like the physics of a ball on a hill. So the ball will tend to want to roll down the hill. There might be a little friction force, maybe due to air or something, that slows the ball down as it rolls down. But the, the behavior is totally intuitive to all of us. The ball will roll down the hill, and if there's a little friction, it'll oscillate at the bottom and eventually come to rest. And this is exactly the same thing that the inflationary field will do, will do at every point. If it's up here for a while, driving inflation at a very high rate, slowly the rate of inflation will go lower and lower because the energy of this vacuum energy that's pushing the universe apart gets smaller and smaller. Eventually it gets to the bottom, inflation ends, and the inflationary energy, as it turns out, can be given off into 
radiation energy. It can be turned into light, and that light can be turned into protons and electrons and stars and us and so on. So this was a nice picture. We have simple physics that tells you how long inflation goes on and how it ends and how inflation gives way to something like the Big Bang universe that's filled with hot radiation and stuff. But there are lots of different curves you can draw. Some of them would look like that one, that, that really simple curve. If, again, I used, used my five-year-old as an experiment and asked him to just draw a curve, his would have all kinds of bumps and wiggles and things. And generically, it, would, it might have a feature like this, where there's a little dip. Now, a gravitational system, like a ball on a hill, if you imagine putting a ball here, what would it do? It would just sit there, right? Because a ball gets stuck. But that's with classical physics. Quantum mechanics tells us that a ball stuck like this actually has some probability of borrowing enough energy to maybe hop over the hill, or, or another way of thinking about it is it just tunnels through. It just magically almost goes through this barrier. This is exactly the same physics of an unstable radioactive atom. Classically, it would just sit there, but quantum mechanics allows it to breach this barrier and fly apart. It turns out that precisely the same thing can happen in inflation. If this is the inflationary field, the, it can sit in some place for a really long time, but by chance, it can form a bubble where the field has tunneled through and created this new region where instead of being at this vacuum energy, it's at this one, and then it can just roll down the hill like that. So you can have a model like this where inflation goes on and on at this value, it forms a bubble, and inside that bubble there's some more inflation, and then inflation ends and gives rise to matter and, and radiation and so on. Now here's the really interesting thing though. If this inflationary expansion is going on at this vacuum energy, you can form these bubbles. These bubbles, as it turns out, expand at the speed of light, essentially. But because the background is expanding exponentially, it's expanding so fast that even the speed of light isn't fast enough. So that if two bubbles form far enough apart, they never overlap. And that inflationary phase in the background never gets eaten up. It never gets completely taken over by the bubbles. So you get a picture that looks like this inflationary phase that keeps expanding. These bubbles nucleate randomly here and there. They expand at the speed of light. But because of the expansion, there's always room for more of these bubbles. You can make as many as you like, and the background just keeps expanding and expanding and expanding. And inside a bubble, you might still have the same process repeated. You might have inflation happening inside that bubble and have more bubbles nucleating inside of it. And there's always plenty of room for more bubbles. So this picture is called eternal or everlasting inflation. The reason is that once it gets started, nothing can end it. No matter how many bubbles form, there's always room for more. The whole process just keeps going on and on and on. So this leads to a very different picture of the whole universe. Because remember, the, the so-called Big Bang is just one little part inside one of these bubbles. So you get this really big inflationary so-called multiverse, where this thing goes on forever. So there are infinitely many times at which these bubbles can form. At each time, there are enormously or infinitely many of these bubbles or pocket universes. And, and here's the really mind-blowing one. Each one of these bubbles, if you go inside it, is infinite. Now that seems, whoops, that seems very strange. Uh, I, keep, I, I keep skipping over the comic. Um, so th this is the poor guy who's told to open the other end of the infinite universe. So, so the, the frustrating thing about you know, this guy and why he's so puzzled is you know, how can you ever create a box that's infinite, and then how are you ever going to figure out whether it's infinite or not? You can ask the same thing about these bubbles. It seems like, you know, I've told you that these bubbles are formed with some size and then they expand, and yet I also tell you that they're infinite inside, so this seems totally ludicrous, and yet um, it's not only possible, but it's, it's sort of understandable. If you'll bear with me for a few moments, I, th I think I can bring you through it. So, 
the way we normally think of space and time is that there's maybe space, so there's me snapping my fingers, and far away there's maybe a supernova going off. Now time, we say either the supernova goes off at the same time as I snap my fingers, or it doesn't. That's the Newtonian concept of time. And I say that these two things happen at the same time, or they don't. And I can say space is all of the things that are happening at a given time. So this is space, and then at a later time this is space, and a later time this is space. But as you may know, Einstein said that's not quite true. Different observers will disagree on whether two events happen at the same time or not. So while one observer might say, when I snap my fingers, a supernova is going off at, say, the center of our galaxy right now, if I just walk at a few meters per second, it turns out that in my description as a moving person, that event at the center of the, at the, center of the galaxy might have happened an hour ago or an hour from now. You, that's using real numbers. So when you get to large scales, even at small velocities, or if you get to s large velocities even on small scales, there is no objective sense in which two events happen at the same time or different times. And so what we say is now depends on whose description we're listening to and, and which observer we're talking about. And they're all equally valid. There, there's nothing wrong with saying that right now the supernova is going off or went off an hour ago or is going to go off in an hour, et cetera. Now again, this tells you that space is, a, is getting a little bit fuzzier because now space can be this now or now space can be this. And those are a little bit different things. Now in general relativity, it gets a little, it, get, it gets even crazier because now there's a total flexibility to say, I'm going to take space time that's, that's the, the thing that I had before. And now, not only can I draw lines at different angles, but I can draw basically any curve I want and say that curve corresponds to a time. So this is a time, this is a later time, this is a later time. I can do it any way I want. There's one limitation, which is that I can't call two things the same time if one of them can affect the other one. That just doesn't make any sense to say that, you know, this happened at the same time as this. Uh, but aside from that, as long as they can't transmit any signals or communicate with each other in any way, you can say they're at the same time. That translates into the so-called light cone. That is, so this, this is the boundary of where light can travel. So if light travels from here in, in the rightward direction, it goes along this edge, and in the leftward direction, it goes along this edge. So as long as this curve stays outside of there, it means that light can't travel from one part of this curve to another. And that means this is a perfectly valid definition of at the same time. And this whole curve represents space at one time. Okay. So now using that flexibility, we can do something very strange, which is let's take normal space again, which normally is one time, the next time, the next time. And now let's define time in a really odd way. Let's say that A time is this funny curve. It's a hyperbola here. That's allowed because no two points on this hyperbola you know, lie in the same light cone. So we're allowed to call that a time. And then you notice something odd, which is that this hyperbola can basically go on forever up that way and still fit in this cone. So this is a light cone, and this curve can fit inside it as far as you like up there. So this means that each of these surfaces can be an infinite space. Okay, this is, remember, space is the set of all points at a given time, and each one of these is, is an infinite one. But they're all nestled inside this light cone. So from one description, it looks like this light cone is of finite size. It goes from here to here, right? In another description, when we're inside and we define space and time in a different way, it goes on forever. And this is not just an academic exercise. This is exactly what one of those bubbles looks like. So the bubble forms with some finite size, given like this. It expands. But the description of physics inside the bubble looks exactly like these surfaces. It turns out that if you pick what are surfaces on which the universe is uniform, that the density of the universe is uniform, they're exactly those hyperbola-like things that are uniform and go on forever. So inside one of these inflationary bubbles, which in one more dimension looks like this. So here's the circle that is now expanding. 
and inside are these nestled kind of cones. Each one of those cones is the space of the universe at a particular time. And they're cut off here, but they, they actually go on forever. So the expanding bubble that you saw before, expanding into that background, is just the boundary of this thing. And once we go inside, we, the more natural way of describing things is to say that each one of those times, at each one of those times, space is infinite. So this is worth paying attention to because this may very well be the structure of our actual universe. Uh, we may well inhabit one of these bubbles, and if we could see infinitely far away, this is the structure of what it would look like. And we can look at this in two sort of views. One is that view that I showed before where we're looking at one time where many of these bubbles exist, and it's just one of those. Another view is this space-time view. If we look at many bubbles coexisting um, with space and time shown, then those different bubbles would form at different places. They'd expand. What this is not showing is that each one is infinite inside because of the limitations of paper and, and computer screens and so on. So that's a pretty wild view of what the, the universe as a whole looks like, quite different from the, the Big Bang that you're accustomed to. What are some of the implications of this? Well, one clear one is that the, the whole enormous observable universe plays a pretty bit part in, in this huge, eternal, infinite drama that's going on. Our observable universe, in particular, the part we can see, sits inside an infinite region with similar properties. That's just our single bubble has infinitely many regions that are the size of our observable universe. And then there are other regions, other bubbles or other types of regions, potentially that have very different properties than the universe that we see. Not just different in sort of detail, but different in kind. They could have a different cosmology, different vacuum energies and different types of galaxies and so on. They could be different in even stranger ways. As it turns out, string theory, and this is a story that I don't have time to tell but is a fascinating one, tells us that the constants of nature that we know and love, like the, the constant, the fine structure constant that determines how strong the electric force is, and constants like that, aren't really fundamental. They actually come from a higher energy theory, string theory, and that they can be different in different regions. And once this eternal inflation process starts happening, it can actually create different bubbles with different values of those fundamental seeming. They're not actually fundamental, but we call them fundamental uh, from our parochial perspective. Fundamental constants could happen in differently in different bubbles. You could even have different numbers of dimensions. You could have a bubble with three, two spatial dimensions, or five or eight spatial dimensions, instead of the three dimensions and one time dimension that we know and love. Or even different sorts of physics. So gravity would still be there, quantum mechanics would still be there, but the details of, say, nuclear forces or the electric force and so on, there might not even be an electric force um, in some other place. So there could be this incredibly diverse set of different regions that are out there. That's a great and interesting story, but I want to focus a little bit on just the first one, that we, have, we sit inside an infinite region with similar properties. Now, this has a, a fascinating implication because each subregion, if we think of what makes our subregion exactly the way we see it, well, physics comes into it, inflation that kind of set the initial conditions, and there's some random component that comes in from inflation as well. But physics also tells us that in a given region of space, or for a given amount of space and a given amount of stuff, there are a finite set of possible configurations that it can have. This set is very, very large. There are a large, large number of different ways you can arrange, say, the atoms in this room, but it's a finite number. And the combination of these two tells you that if there are infinitely many different regions, each one is kind of corresponds to some roll of the dice, but there are a finite set of possibilities, that they're going to have to be duplications. It's like if you're playing tic-tac-toe, it gets boring because you keep feeling like you're playing the same game over and over again. In fact, I, I looked it up. There are 27,000 different actual games of tic-tac-toe that could be played. So if you did it quickly, you could finish them all in a week or so. 
And then no matter what you did, you'd be playing the same game of tic-tac-toe over again that you already played. Right? The universe could very well be the same sort of situation. In this room, it turns out there are about 10 to the, 10 to the 28 different ways, that the configurations that the matter in this room could have. That's a stupendously large number. In the universe, it's more like 10 to the 10 to the 120th. These are colossal, fantastically large numbers, and, and yet next to infinity, they're totally pathetically in, and, and small. Infinity trumps any number that you can write down, no matter how big it is. And so there will be duplicates elsewhere. So there, in fact, is a copy of this lecture happening out there somewhere, if we look far enough away. <laughs> but it may be you know, that there's a small variation. I could be wearing a pink bow tie, or less commonly, sporting a unicorn horn, et cetera. So they're out there. There are also all possible variations on the world that we know and love. Some of them are, are probably pretty common, like, like the ones where the Nazis won the war, or where you know, Attila the Hun did a little bit better, or, or Genghis Khan did a little bit better, and we're all part of the Mongolian Empire. This picture, by the way, proves that you can find any picture on the internet. <laughs> Some of them less common, like where the guys who got Bin Laden actually were you know, these guys. <laughs> <laughs> and on a more personal level, you know, there are infinitely many of you, too, that are out there experiencing all the things that maybe you didn't get to experience in your life. But you know, then again, there are also ones out there that are experiencing things that you'd rather not experience. And you know, it's also true, the old adage, that wherever you go in the multiverse, there you are. Um, and some people will just find happiness or unhappiness anywhere. So it, it seems worth you know, not worrying too much and focusing on where, where we are and how we can improve ourselves. And, and besides, these other universes are so far away, we're never going to go see the duplicate of ourselves and see if they're happier or sadder than us and so on. But still, they're interesting. And, and, and we can ask, um, what, is, what is their status? And in particular, you know, this is kind of a fantastical story that I've been spinning for you. But is it just rank speculation? Is this just kind of a fantasy? Is it philosophy? Is it science? Can we test it? And this is not just some curmudgeonly, you know, uh, it's not real science kind of thing. This is important. You know, part of what makes science have this truth value such that a lot of us in this room are passionate about it is that it does have an answer. Nature does provide us a yes or no answer at some point to the questions we ask. But I also think that nature is a little bit more allowing and, and will allow us to discover things a little bit more profound than we sometimes give it credit for. And that some of the things we call speculation or philosophy at one time, 100 years later, are pretty much mainstream science. Now in this case, it's certainly true that inflation itself can be tested. As I showed you, it's already been tested. It's made particular predictions that have come true. The next satellite that will be bearing on this is the Planck satellite. It's up, it's taking data. The data is apparently beautiful, and we'll soon have results from it within the, probably the next year or two that may confirm what we already know, and they may actually show more smoking gun evidence that inflation happened. There are particular predictions that it made that could come true. It's also true that some versions of eternal inflation, such as this bubbly version that I told you about, can be falsified. So the curvature of the universe, I told you, it is observed to be flat. But it could be that this Planck satellite comes up with evidence that it's slightly positively curved, that is, curved like a sphere. That turns out to be completely incompatible with this bubble picture. Those surfaces that I showed you, those hyperbolic bowl-like things, those correspond to negative curvature not curved like a sphere, but the other way. And so if the Planck satellite detected positive curvature, it would falsify this view of eternal inflation and maybe even string theory itself. Speaking of string theory, the dominant paradigm of string theory, so string theory is our currently best idea for quantum gravity and for understanding the unification of the different forces that we have. The best understanding we have of string theory implies eternal inflation of just the sort that I described with these bubbles, where the different bubbles have different properties at low energies, even though they're all unified by this string theory at very high energies. So if we had good evidence for string theory, we would actually have good, good evidence for eternal inflation in other universes, which is pretty, pretty spectacular. 
if only we had any kind of evidence for string theory, which we don't. But all this is nice and, and might be convincing if you're ready to be convinced, but it would be nice if we could get direct observational evidence that some of this is happening. Is that possible? I think actually maybe it is. So one thing that flew by faster than, than you probably could have caught it is if you look right there, there's one bubble running into another bubble, right? In the space-time diagram, that would look kind of like this. So here's this blue bubble that's expanding, and here are the, the different spaces in it. But it gets hit by this red bubble. Now there's kind of a battle where, where one of the other bubbles has to expand into the other one that basically depends on which vacuum energy is higher. Um, the lower vacuum energy turns out to win. But even if this bubble expands into the other one and kind of takes it over, there's still a, an imprint here. And that imprint corresponds to some kind of fluctuation, some variation in an early, one of these early times in the universe, something that we could look back on in, say, the microwave background and see if we have any evidence for it. Now, the geometry here is a little bit obscure, but it's less obscure if you think of that microwave background sphere that we're looking at. If it gets intersected by another sphere, that's the other bubble running into it, the intersection between those is a disk. So we can imagine that they're actually a disk on the sky that's influenced by the collision of our bubble with another bubble. So could this make sense? Well, if, if you work out the details, and I and, I, and a student have, have started a program um, where we've been trying to work out the details, it turns out that it's actually not so crazy. And you can think about some of the basic properties that would happen in the microwave background sky if you had such a collision. So here's a kind of simulated bubble collision. You can kind of make out this, this disk-like imprint. The diskiness and the fact that it would be kind of a, a patch on the sky that's symmetric about some point. So there'd be kind of circles that are, that are the same in that, in that bruise that you see. That's generic. And if you work out, sort of go through the, the horrible, let me tell you, geometry of figuring out these bubble collisions and, and, and how they translate into the observables and so on, it turns out that you can expect to see something like this in the microwave background sky if the bubbles form fast enough. And that's just so that there, there's a high enough probability that there is one in the region of the universe that we get to observe. If they're not wiped out by inflation inside our bubble, so remember inflation does this spectacularly good job of smoothing out the universe by stretching everything to big scales. If there's too much inflation inside our bubble, it'll just wipe out any evidence that there were other ones that ran into it. That would be sad, but, but it's quite possible. So as, so as long as those two happen, um, it may well be that there could be such imprints on the CMB. And in fact, some models can already be ruled out. There are some versions of inflation and bubbles where if there were a collision, there would basically be a big hole in the sky. This, is, this co would correspond to a place, a direction in which inflation didn't happen, and it would basically look just like a big nothing there. We don't see that, and so any model of bubbles and, and eternal inflation that would predict that, you can rule out right away. So already this can put constraints on different theories by the fact that there aren't such things. But we'd really like to ask, given that we don't see anything obvious like that, are there bubble impact effects on the microwave background sky that we actually see? So there it is. Can you see any? I don't know. There's kind of a big you know, dark blue patch here. Um, you can look around. It's not easy. It's, nothing jumps out at you. So you have to think how to do a, a more careful analysis where you actually you know, do this numerically, carefully analyzing the data. This is actually quite tricky to look for anomalies in the CMB, things that aren't predicted by the standard picture. Famously, for example, here are Stephen Hawking's initials. <laughs> They're out there. If, you're, if your initials are SH, you can be proud also. Or HS, if you look it upside down. Um, you're in the CMB too. So if you just keep looking for funny things in the CMB, you'll find them. And then you'll say, wow, what are the odds that I could have found Stephen Hawking in the CMB? I mean, the, the odds are tiny, so it must be real. But of course, you have to sort of divide that by how many different possible things you would have noticed that were odd um, and, and wondered at. So you have to be really, really careful in this game. You have to first decide exactly what you're looking for. 
and then you have to very carefully weigh the evidence for that anomaly versus that, that pattern that you see coming from just chance, given the observed data. But you can do this responsibly. The methodology in a preliminary, preliminary analysis have been done, in fact, by, by my former student, Matt Johnson, and some other collaborators. And they've applied this to the microwave background data the w, from the WMAP satellite. Um, I figured they wouldn't find anything. Amazingly, they, they found a few things that were somewhat tantalizing, nothing that was strong enough to actually claim any sort of detection. All of them, you know, were, the chance of finding them is like one in 20 or something like that. Of course, that didn't stop the headlines from saying that we found evidence for other universes in the microwave background. Um, so are these things going to turn out to be true? You know, probably not. I, I, might, hope that, I might hope so, but, but I, I honestly doubt it. But, but we will find out when the Planck data comes in, they will be assiduously analyzing it and running the probabilities and finding out if they actually see anything, the same things that they saw. These are all simulated things, by the way, so don't get too excited about this, for example. Um, so I hope that they do, but, but I doubt that they will. Um, but it's exciting, and it shows that in principle, at least, the possibility of getting real evidence for these things out there exists. So where does this put us? You know, we, we, we have this very different picture now of, of where we fit into the whole big scheme of things. Um, I think what we know is that this wonderfully successful and well-tested Big Bang cosmology um, works. It describes the universe beautifully back 14 billion years or so. But it also tells us that there's a, a strong suggestion that it's just the end of this previous inflationary period. And if so, that inflation period very possibly went on forever, eternally, has always been going on essentially and will continue to always go on in the future, endlessly spawning huge regions infinitely bigger than the universe that we can see. And so if we maybe somewhere look inside a bubble, inside another bubble, inside another bubble, maybe inflation goes to low enough energy so that the laws of physics decouple and we can form complex structures and um, radiation and matter and so on can form. And out there, other bubbles may be existing. They may be doing their things. They may have their own physics and life and so on. Um, but we're here in this one. And although the universe is big, maybe much bigger than it seemed like at the beginning of this lecture, almost inconceivably big, it's not quite inconceivably big. Because through this process of, of careful observation and, and creative theorizing and hard work over 100 years by scientists worldwide, we've really come to the point where we actually can understand, we can really grapple with our universe as a whole. And maybe, just maybe, more besides. Thank you for your attention. And correct me if I'm wrong, though, but I thought I heard at one time that the Andromeda galaxy and the Milky Way galaxy were going to, at some point in time, collide. That's and right. Okay. Yeah, so, so the, there are two things going on. On small scales, things can be gravitationally, gravitationally bound, just like we're gravitationally bound to the sun. The expansion of the universe will never do anything about that. We're, we're irrevocably there. So the expansion of the universe really only takes hold on very large scales, larger than, say, the local group of galaxies that includes us and Andromeda. So our, our galaxy and Andromeda are gravitationally bound. They will, in a few billion years, merge together into milk andromeda or something. I, there, there's a name for it. Um, but on larger scales, the galaxies will continue to go away. And due to this vacuum energy, this cosmological constant, in fact, they will do so at a greater and greater rate. So that eventually, there will only be, in the whole observable universe, 
essentially the stuff that is gravitationally bound to us now. So the local group, us and Andromeda, and a few other galaxies, that'll be everything that we can see in the observable universe because everything else will have essentially accelerated and moved away to such a great distance that we won't get any more light from it. So that, so that will be sad. Um, so we should be thankful that Andromeda is, you know, our, our long time descendants should be thankful that we at least get two galaxies worth of stuff rather than just one because we have Andromeda stuff with us. Is this on? Yeah. This is a question that's probably in the lecture in itself. So it's a very broad question, but it, so you may want to tackle it several ways. And that's the idea of time. You've talked about space and matter. Mm -hmm. But how does time tie into this relative to these different bubbles? Yeah. The, the concept of what time is today, which is this eternal question that we grapple with, has that changed at all as this idea of multi universes or multiverses yeah. has emerged? Well, I, what I find fascinating about this picture is that it's sort of the ultimate example of Einstein's relativity of time. So, so it all seems innocent when you say, well, we can't quite agree on what things are happening at the same time and so on. It seems strange and unintuitive, but, but harmless enough. But when you put it to these huge scales and you say, you realize that even questions like, is the universe finite or infinite, depend on precisely how you define what is now. That, that you really see time coming into a very central role. So the, the distinction between a finite size bubble and the infinite size universe that's inside is precisely the distinction in the definition of what is now, so what is space that is everything at a given time. And it's, it's very strange when you start to think about, um, you know, we, we feel like we have choices, we, we uh, make decisions, we affect the future, and so on. And yet there's some observer somewhere for whom everything that's going to happen in this room five minutes, in the next five minutes, has already happened, you know, in a very, in a very direct and real sense. They, you know, can't get that information and give it to us now um, so that we can, you know, prevent the things from happening. But the description in physics makes it really unclear how we can distinguish the past from the future by some line that delineates the present, like we very intuitively feel. It tells us that that, that line d delineating the present, you know, is really fairly fictitious. And we can disagree on it, and we can all have our own version of it, but we can't really claim that it has its own reality. And I think that the structure of these bubbles is kind of the ultimate in-your-face uh, example of, of that relativity of time. And, and it, it troubles me sometimes to, to think about it that way. I don't know if that helped your question, but, but <laughs> it's a tough, fascinating one. It's a tough question. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so our universe right now is expanding exponentially. Is that the given? It is, it is just starting into its exponential okay. expansion. Yeah. Okay. So at some point it was like a linear expansion at some time, and then it made a transition into an exponential expansion. That's right. When did that happen? Is there a, an idea of when that happened? Or is yeah, that so that can be measured. I don't, it was some number maybe five billion years ago. So this is, this is now known because we can, with the supernova data, we can essentially trace out the expansion history accurately enough to see when it went from deceleration to acceleration. Um, and I think it was five around million? five billion years ago. Five million or five billion? Billion. 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 Yeah. Five billion years ago. Okay. Um, give or take a few billion. Okay. Cool. Right, thank you. Uh, if the you know the theory of the bubbles and um, you know infinite expansion is true, are there any theories about what would happen when one bubble with a certain set of physical laws, how those laws would interact with another bubble if there was a collision? How yeah. would the different sets of physical laws interact with each yeah, other? Yeah, yeah. So so there, it it's. Interesting, but a little bit less fun than it might seem. So we don't get to sort of overlap with them and see the weird physics that they get to experience. What happens is that there's a, a so-called domain wall in between the two. So essentially, there's a barrier in between our region with our physics and another region with the other physics. And in that barrier is very high energies in which our physics is unified into the same, say, string theory, high energy physics and the other one is unified also. So it's kind of the same physics at high energies that breaks into two different sets of physics at low energies in different regions. 
in between would be some region where they're unified again. So there'd be kind of a smooth transition where we'd go into the barrier, energy would go super high so that we, you, physics was unified. We'd go out of the other side of the barrier into this other region where physics was disunified again, was broken again at low energies, in a, but in a different way from this region. So there would, be, there would always be that barrier in between where physics was unified. Um, and that barrier is not something we could go through and still be us. So, so that, that's sad, but you know, at least we're protected from, from the horrible creatures of the other physics <laughs> realm. Um, so if like the little bubbles, they're all individual universes, what would you call like the big space that they're contained in? This is actually one of the deepest problems in this field is that all the words are bad. So, so calling these things universes is bad because universe means everything that is, right? So calling a bubble a universe, that's, that's no good. Um, yet people still do it. The terminology that seems to be catching on that I like is that the bubbles are either bubbles or pockets. And the whole thing is sometimes either the universe with a capital U or it's the multiverse. Um, for a while, I, I, I thought about the, the key thing with these pockets is that they get hot. Inflation ends and they heat up. So I thought about calling them hot pockets, but there were <laughs> trademark issues and everything. So it's an unsettled question, but it, we're working on it. We're working on it. We'll, we'll hope to come to a consensus soon. Question from a fellow Santa Cruzan. Um, you lost me where, you, know, you remember you had the uh, lines of constant time that intersected the uh, light cones at the cross point of the X. Yeah. And, that, and that all made sense. But then uh, you were talking about how those hyperbolas were all, you know, the, I thought that those hyperbolas were lines of constant time and the whole line, the whole hyperbola was contained inside a light cone. That's right. Whereas earlier you had been saying that Hey, can only, there can only be one point of it in the light cone, so, so, so the, there was some disconnect. The idea there. of those light cones was just basically to say that you, as long as you keep your line from tilting more than 45 degrees, basically you're okay. So once it tilts more than 45 degrees on a plot like that, then one of those points can communicate with the other. As long as it's less than 45 degrees, you're okay. So for those hyperbolas that I showed, no matter how far up you go, you're still at slightly less than 45 degrees. And so you can continue those things forever without ever going too steep and turning into a, a curve that can't be an equal time surface. So the, I, I was using the light cones for two different purposes. One was that um, to show that as long as you didn't go too steep, your curve was okay. The other was to show that within a, that single light cone, um, which, which constitutes something that could kind of be caused by a particular cause. So, so everything within a, within a light cone could in some sense come from some cause, like the creation of a bubble. You could stay within something like that and still have one of these infinite curves. And so it's telling you how you can have an infinite space, which nonetheless can all sort of have gotten a signal from a particular thing that happened, like the creation of a bubble. Now this takes, you know, a lot of bending your mind into it. Um, but when I first saw that you could create an infinite universe out of a finite thing, you know, I've, ne I've sort of never gotten over the, the profound excitement of seeing that that's possible. I mean, it seems like one of these things that just a priori seems impossible, right? It, ph philosophically, it seems like you can't take a finite thing and turn it into an infinite thing, period, done. And yet, you can. So, so this is an illustration, I think, of how um, physics and mathematics not only give us details, but they also open up whole new ways of conceptualizing things that you just would never come up with if you didn't have that real physical and mathematical theory to guide you into them. I like that uh, question on um, uh, Andromeda Galaxy and the local uh, versus the, you know, the expansion and uh, the, the barrier between, you know, uh, local gravitation versus this, uh, this expansion. Is it the background perturbations that is the, that is the, um, the barrier for um, looking at large, small scale versus large scale expansion? It, it's essentially, so there, there's a particular size which is of order, uh, 
five or 10 megaparsecs where, where it's, things start to be essentially nonlinear, where things, systems start to be sort of bound to each other given the amount of time that the universe has had to build up structures um, and the size that those fluctuations started out at the beginning. So if they started bigger, we'd have bigger things by now that were bound to each other. Um, and if we had a longer time to wait before the cosmological constant took over, we also would form bigger things that were bound. So that, yeah, there's, there's, this, there's just sort of a critical distance that cosmology has had time to build bound stuff. And smaller than that, something, you know, things will tend to be bound to each other, but, in, but they won't be in this cosmological expansion, the initial Hubble expansion. Um, and that, that's around five or 10 megaparsecs that that transition happens. Okay. In the picture of two bubbles colliding, the one that showed the hyperbolic constant time curves, mm -hmm. it looked like they were intersecting so that the time dimension in one bubble would correspond to one of the spatial dimensions in the other bubble and vice versa. Would that actually happen? Um, I, maybe we should talk more afterwards because I'm not sure I'm totally understanding what you're getting at, but I, I'd be happy to work with you afterwards on it. As it uh, has anybody speculated uh, at all? Uh, I know you guys spend a lot of time speculating um, on uh, what happens between the bubbles. Uh, is there any coupling between the bubbles? For example, some sort of tachyonic kind of forces. So, so there's there's sort of two questions. One is a question of if we write down some simple model of inflation, you know, like my five-year-old drawing a curve, what what sort of picture would that look like? And that's essentially what I've done here. There's a much harder question, which is something like, suppose string theory were right, and it really gave this eternal inflation with all these different regions and all these different constants of nature and so on. It turns out that that picture is incredibly complicated. So for example, rather than a curve just in one dimension, there are 500 different dimensions or more in which you have to draw that picture. And so, you know, one, it's hard enough to understand. Two, you know, people are just getting into, a, into it a little bit. 500, forget about it. Um, at the same time, I think that the basics are not that different in the sense that if you're in between the bubbles, you are essentially just in some inflating region and the physics are just that of inflation, um, which, is mo which is essentially you're dominated by this vacuum energy and there's exponential expansion. And until, one of these bubble nucleation events happens, not much else does. So, so the physics is in some sense very simple in between the bubbles. It's in the transitions and in sort of the overall structure that things start to get interesting. Thank you. So you said there would be um, like, in our, like variations of the right now what's happening, like us in the theater, except there's variations. Are there places where there could be no variation whatsoever? Like Meaning are there, uh, variations on, on what's happening in this room? Well, or like or in, said, the, in the fundamental constants and things like that? Well, yeah, something like that. If you're, whether you had a unicorn horn or not. Something yeah, like so, that. so there would be essentially every, everything that can happen given the laws, you know, any, everything that we could imagine coming out of the same laws of physics and similar initial conditions um, as our observable room or universe, et cetera, would be out there somewhere. Now, the, the odds would vary dramatically. So, so probably the versions of me with unicorn horns are gonna be much, much rarer than without because it's evolutionarily a kind of strange thing to have a unicorn horn on a primate, probably. Um, so, so certain things are gonna be very uncommon Certain things will be, um, and it may be that our type of universe is very uncommon, um, but certain variations on ours will be common versus uncommon. And that's where probably the interesting stuff happens because if, in, in those odds, um, because it, you know, if, you're, if you're gambling, you don't so much care about the, I mean, it, it may be really important if you, if you uh, draw a royal flush, but you know, 
that's not what you want to bank on and what, not what you're going to be thinking about most of the time. You're going to be thinking about what do I do with this pair? And in the same way, um, thinking about these other universes, there will be other crazy stuff going on. But what's more interesting is thinking about what are the typical properties, what are the, the typical variations? Um, because one of the questions that comes up is if we have this theory that predicts all these different universes or, or bubbles or pockets with different properties, then how do we test that theory? Because the question is, which properties do we go out and compare to our observed universe, right? If it predicts all these different ones. So we may have to ask questions like, which predicted properties are really common versus which ones are incredibly rare? And we would like to, to say that our universe ought to be, all things being equal in some sense, one of the more common ones. We wouldn't want to say that our universe is one of the incredibly strange, you know, bizarre universes given the theory. So, so you, you do have to worry about the relative odds and, and which things are common and uncommon. Um, you don't have to worry too much about going there and, and getting speared by me. So, <laughs> May I and, ask? So the idea was propagation of information. There, you are actually bringing out infinite uh, amount of uh, information from any pocket. The way I understood is, um, the universe is expanding, and after the, some inflation, there is the renucleation of another universe in, in this, and then again, infinite amount of information rise from there, and uh, there is somehow semblance of time in this, which, which is, I don't know how, and then there is semblance of uh, um, uh, some some guiding principle, I don't know what guiding principle is valid throughout this multiple inverses. That's what I want to know. Yeah, so, so we, I, all of this, you, you have to have some kind of backbone to build all this on. And the backbone that, that most of what I've discussed is built on is essentially Einstein's general relativity and, and it's coupled to some sort of fields that we basically understand. And that may, the, the way to look at that really would be in some sort of quantum gravity theory or some sort of unified theory like string theory that would really provide the, the kind of scaffolding that would actually tell you what's happening in detail. So if, if whatever the, the true sort of fundamental theory of the world is, assuming there is such a thing, assuming that it, it provides general relativity at a somewhat lower energy than the absolute maximum energy, um, and that it introduces and that it allows inflation, which we want to explain our observed universe, then I think it will give rise to something pretty similar to this. Um, if not, then not. Ah, uh, are the... Bubbles uniformly spread, or are there galaxies of bubbles? And mm. yeah, the the so what what the bubbles are in some sense um, they are kind of uniform in that the creation of one of these bubbles is a, a purely random process. So quantum mechanics is the one thing in nature that really really is random. You know, when you throw a dice, it seems random, but if you were infinitely good at doing physics and, and seeing where the dice was going, you could predict what was going to happen. But quantum mechanics is truly random. And so the formation of one of these bubbles, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing, the bubble forms, it's random, there's nothing that causes it. And so the pattern of bubbles will have, it'll, it'll have some pattern, but not a discernible pattern. It won't be like a galaxy that, that has some interesting structure to it. It will look very random. So you can characterize it, but it will look pretty random and uniform rather than built in nice structures like the universe we see. Thank you. Thank you. Hopefully, uh, two quick questions here. Um, first of all, how, how certain are you that the universe will continuously inflate? And number two, what is the role of black holes in your theory? Okay, so how certain am I that the universe continues to inflate. Not certain. So, so the, uh, 
you know, if I had to give my personal odds that inflation itself happened and is part of the explanation for the universe that we see, I'd probably put those odds at, you know, 50, 75 percent, um, which is pretty spectacular odds, you know, given how hard it is to figure this stuff out. But, you know, there could be some other explanations. There are rival theories to inflation. I don't think they're nearly as nice, but it could be that one of those is right. Then the question of whether inflation implies this eternal inflation with the chief going on, that's a subtle one because unless you know what the physics really is behind inflation, you can't say whether it causes this eternal inflation. You can write down inflation models that don't do this, that just do inflation for a little while and then stop. So you can write those down. They're a little bit more awkward often to write down than these models. This is a little bit more generic, but you certainly can't rule it out. So, you know, if the measure were, you know, using my five-year-old to draw inflationary potentials, then most of them would have this behavior. But that doesn't mean that the one that actually happened has this behavior. I think that we can't answer. So we can try to get more constraints on what inf the physics of inflation is observationally with these microwave background satellites. We can look for something like these, these collisions or some other evidence of eternal inflation. We can look for evidence of string theory. Um, but I think at the moment, we can't make any kind of ironclad link between inflation happening and this happening. And then the, uh, I forgot the other question. Black holes, black holes. Black holes. Um, so black holes would, would form in, uh, in these universes once, or, or these bubbles once they're sufficiently evolved to form bound structures. Um, one question which I would like to know the answer to, but, but haven't worked out in enough detail is, um, you know, these bubbles, as they're expanding, they're, they're these hugely energetic things that expand at the speed of light. They're kind of an unstoppable force. What happens when one of them, one of them runs into a black hole, which is sort of the immovable object? Um, something interesting, but I haven't had time to work out what it actually is yet. So I'd like to do that. And ask me again another year or two, and maybe I'll have an answer. Uh, yeah, so um, I was thinking of that graph where you had the different uh, bubble universes, and there was like infinite number of them, um, and you talked about how it was the uh, speed of light is why you couldn't send information from one to another. Yeah. And so I was wondering if uh, there'd be a way with quantum entanglement to send information from one bubble universe to another? Yeah, so, so if quantum entanglement, well, there's two problems. One is that you can't actually send information with quantum entanglement in general. You can have correlations between things that seem awfully strange, but you can't, as it turns out, actually use it to communicate information. Frustrating, but true. The other is that the quantum entanglement generally has to arise from something. So you would, it, it is conceivable that there could be some process that where two bubbles essentially were formed, you know, as part of one process and moved far apart, but were entangled in some way that could be interesting. And some people have thought about, um, have thought about that. And I'm not sure that I really buy the way they're looking at it, but, but people are thinking along those lines. I think you still wouldn't be able to communicate with the other bubbles. You'd need something like faster than light travel or a warp drive or a wormhole or something like that if you want to do it. And those, those are expensive. <laughs> yeah, if I understand correctly, uh, dark energy and vacuum energy is the same thing. Is that right? That, sorry, I, I, I was not clear. So dark energy and vacuum energy are two separate things. Dark energy is like regular stuff in that it's, it's material. It, gravitates, it has an attractive gravitational force. It just is dark in the sense that it doesn't interact with normal stuff. So you can imagine it as sort of a, a, a gas or something of particles that's out there. It conglomerates into, into things, not solid objects, but, but bound gas balls kind of that, that undergird the formation of galaxies. But it doesn't interact with regular stuff or light and hence it's dark. Dark energy is a more uniform substance. It doesn't gather into things, and it has, it has associated with it this anti-gravity force. So there, there are two different substances with quite different properties. One agglomerates and is attractive. One is uh, repulsive and doesn't agglomerate. Um, and we think we may actually figure out what the dark matter is sometime soon, either in experiments, uh, underground experiments in the Large Hadron Collider, or it's seeing uh, gamma rays given off by it. The dark energy, no one's going to tell you that we're going to understand it anytime soon. 
Did I say dark matter? I meant the dark energy versus vacuum energy. Dark energy and, va dark energy and vacuum energy are probably the same thing. Is there any ideas on maybe some way we might be able to detect it, perhaps even harness it? That would be great, uh, but the short answer is no. No, there are no good ideas for how we can detect it, other than on its effect on cosmology. So if you have one, I'm all ears, but, but it's hard. If we were able to detect gravity waves, would that be something that would be useful to look past the CMB to one of these other bubbles? It might, it might. So, so it's possible that, so if we could see gravity waves, the first experiments that we'll see them will tend to, to probe things like uh, neutron stars and black holes merging and so on. Uh, future gravity wave experiments could probe the physics of inflation, which would be very useful. Those could, in principle, also give us information if there were bubble collisions. Oddly, it turns out that just two bubbles colliding in the simplest version don't give any gravity waves at all. Um, it, it's due to the symmetries of the situation, so that's frustrating. But if you have multiple collisions or slightly you know, more interesting scenarios, then you can get gravity waves from them, and it would be a great signature. Nobody has really worked out those predictions in detail. Let's thank Dr. Pierre again. Thank you. So thank you, everyone, and we'll see you in the fall of 2012 back in this room.